everyone. My name is Anka Serbanescu, and I am one of the team organizers for the 2023 Solar Punk Conference. I am now excited to introduce our distinguished guest speaker, the world renowned computer hacker, artist, and professor John Trett. Today, John will be sharing some insights on the fascinating topic of optimistic futuring and hacktivism, reminding us to envision optimistic futures and take actionable steps to bring them to life. I will now welcome John Trett to the virtual stage to enlighten us with his captivating presentation. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm glad you guys could make it today. Why don't I introduce myself a little bit first? My name's John Threat. Most importantly, I'm definitely a solar punk, a recovering, what I would say, cyberpunk. I definitely love the high tech, low life I used to be involved in. But at a certain point, I began to realize that the sort of rugged individualism, the sort of like capitalistic mindset, the like detachment from nature, the sort of like the ideas around uh, envisioning and wanting a dystopian future had been sort of encoded in me in a lot of ways by forces I didn't really understand, including the fact that like, you know, in a lot of ways, some of the futures that we think of the future are actually um, engineered inside of uh, think tanks that are hired by corporations that want a future of of, of, of sublimating nature and consuming as many products as possible. In that evolution, um, I started to become a solar punk. And I feel like I've made that transformation, although certainly it's an ongoing process, understanding it. And in understanding that for me, like community is the new hero, not like individuals. It's the idea of creating you know, uh, sustainable, resilient networks, um, <laughs> an inclusive future that understands that the entire planet, is, we're part of it um, and how we can uh, reconnect to those grounding things that make us human accent those parts of us. Now, my background to all of this, of course, is that uh, I'm a hacker I used to break into computers all over the world. Currently, uh, <laughs> I've gotten a lot of press for being a hacker, but more importantly now, I'm a professor that teaches solar punk to young students on the university level and excited to get their ideas and it inspired me. I think solar punk's great. I think it's um, whenever you have a new culture emergent, there's all these aspects to it. One of the most, most alluring things I think to a lot of people is the optimistic future in part. I mean, there's obviously parts evolving, music, culture, aesthetics, direct action, which is kind of what I'll be talking about today, which is like, Hacktivism. Hacktivism, the reason that I think it's important when we talk about solar punk is the idea that, yes, we're thinking about these optimistic futures, but at the same time, as we begin to shape these optimistic futures, um, we do live in an encroaching surveillance and state and a panopticon, one that, you know, uses technology to sort of make the playing field un unlevel so that they can sway people's opinions. Um, and of course, if you do things that are deemed sort of um, illegal in order it, that oftentimes these laws can be put, passed by corporations, we need, we as individuals and as communities need to think about how we can level the playing field by being able to use technology in a lot of ways as subtle ways, as passive ways to do it, to sort of increase community, increase awareness about different issues and, and obviously the solar punk ethos. And I think in that regard, it's important because the state will always seek to sort of save its own power um, until one day that power is sort of converted into like the communities that we want to see, how we would like to see ourselves govern in the future, which is of course an evolving thing. In a lot of ways, everyone here is an exciting time to sort of be in this like nascent time of, of imagination and thinking optimistically about how we can shape the new future and the conversations that we are having now will reverberate into the future for other generations. But for right now, um, unfortunately, <laughs> the sort of the system can like um, bear down on us. So what I want to do. First, let me give you some examples. Boom. Okay. 
actively. So first, let me go over some examples of why you might want to consider some of the skills. And of course, like you, these are just ideas. You can shape them. There's other riffs on top of them that you might find useful for yourself. Here we go. So um, the here's an example of like how um, Madison Square Garden used facial recognition to ban its owner's enemies. Now, and the idea of it, of course, was like, yo, this is for your safety. It's posed like we could potentially stop criminals. But the owners of Madison Square Garden actually used it to turn away people that, you know, who were from what, what could be almost described as a for-profit public space. They used them to, to reject them. Um, obviously, this is like an ongoing, this is actually an ongoing litigation that the owners will probably lose. But the point is, is that, you know, they felt no compunction about using facial recognition to be able to affect the, um, you know, to, to, to ban their enemies that they felt were, um, um, that they wanted to punish. Now, um, in general, like when we're talking about surveillance technology um, and other means of technological control from state and corporations, one sad fact is that it is almost universally polished um, on indigenous populations um, that, you know, across the world. Um, obviously, you know, it, it's because they don't, they usually don't have, um, they don't have the same level of rights or voice in a uh, society. So, um, and then it's obviously they can tap into, you know, um, uh, people who want to exploit them to go ahead and green light being able to, you know, um, use surveillance against them uh, to, be able to uh, control the resources on the land that they may occupy. Um, and when I say occupy, actually, I should say more like live there. Um, but, you know, the forces that be have decided that they, they would love their resources and technologies used against them. Uh, once again, this is where like sort of like activism and direct action in evolving and our understanding of making a better world can come in handy either to um, to both um, balance the um, the technology that's being used against um, indigenous populations, um, and that, and of course, that technology is eventually used against everyone else who's not indigenous in a given a given country. Um, but it really starts there, and when no one speaks up, or when no one like passes around the skills to be able to balance it, what you get is these, um, you know, uh, encroaching technological state that's able to do whatever they want, whenever they want. And of course, the outcome is usually they're able to take the resources and be able to, you know what I mean, punish people for even trying to just live in their own lands um, and, and not face destruction. Like here's another example of intense, intense police surveillance for indigenous land defenders. Um, this is actually true. This is this particular example is in Canada. Obviously this goes um, on like with the, the Uyghurs, um, it happens in New Zealand, it happens in um, Australia. Um, it just happens everywhere, including like um, with um, indigenous people in America um, who also, you know, have a greater voice than ever, but yet still, you know, there's still a constant battle for people who, you know, inside the state that would love to control the resources where they live at. Um, and, and like I said, they also find it as a great testing ground for controlling us. Now, I'm not also, I also want to take the minute to say that technology can also be good in that, like for instance, with the, in Brazil, they've used it to help um, indigenous people um, keep their lands, um, monitor them and stuff. But the problem is, is that the forces that be are so strong, they still um, often kill uh, uh, the indigenous people there who are just trying to, you know, maintain their lands and the, and the, uh, and the Amazon um, and the natural beauty of it that sustains them and sustains actually the entire planet. Obviously, once again, even though the technology is used good, I mean, the forces that be are using every new technological trick in the book to sort of erase this, the indigenous people of the, of the Amazon. 
Now I want to go into some passive examples that we can use in different ways to spread messages. Some of these are going to be, you know, everyday things that everyone can do. And then some of them are going to be like more advanced, but, you know, but to me, it's about your own imagination, how you could be in, you know, take a look at these and, you know, think about how you could use these or riff on these in ways to like, you know, take direct action or passively spread messages of all kinds. And, and, and honestly, it could also be reflected in art. Now, one of the small things that I, I particularly love is like the idea of just renaming like your Wi-Fi network into something positive. People see it. Unfortunately, we hear we often are, you know, uh, jumping on the Wi-Fi networks and the names matter. Some people choose humorous names. Some people choose names that identify with them. Sometimes, a lot of times they pick, um, you know, consumerist messages that they're passing on. Um, but for me, I think it's uh, like, this is an example of one Wi-Fi network that I have, um, which is fight climate change where you can. That's just an uh, easy example of like, yo, how many people might see it? Maybe 20, but you know what? All 20 of those people saw it. Now are gonna, you know, like if 10% of them were like, hey, you know, maybe I should, you know, reconsider my position on, you know what I mean? The, the, the environment, that would be great. Why don't I jump into facial recognition since we actually talked about um, the idea of the encroaching date with, the, with uh, Madison Square Garden as an example, but also the fact that um, oftentimes uh, when, you, when you protest or take direct action, you think about it, they record people's faces all the time and they put people into databases and then they share these databases at cost. Your, not only is your identity marked, but then it's used in, in presentations and, and, you know, for money exchange for money in databases, um, like in Peter Thiel's company, um, for an example. Um, and there's more, there's insidious ones that he invested in. That, like I said, they they traffic in in people's personal information and tying it to a face. So that regard, let's look at this example of people using like low tech ways to not only express themselves artistically but also throw off facial recognition. Um, now, like, yes, in everyday um, life, we don't think about it, but, you know, there's been, you know, there's a trade-off for safety with it, like there's ring cameras everywhere, but your face is constantly going into databases that are saved and sometimes wind up in places you would probably not want. Um, some people who use Facebook, like, for instance, I don't use Facebook, but, like, some people who use Facebook are alarmed to see that it can recognize their face at any angle because they've given it years of data of their face. But um, this is an example of an artistic way. This is an example of um, sort of reflective like paint or strips that throw off cameras and it reflects the light back um, in certain, in, in a lot of different kind of um, security cameras. So all it sees is a bright light of the light reflecting back at it, which is kind of beautiful. But just to go over the, the face recognition thing is that there's actually even clothes to that you can wear that go off facial recognition systems very easily, like um, in order to, it'll it'll totally throw it off and make, it won't even scan your face. You'll, it'll just think you're like a giraffe. For instance, some people print clothes that have things. So the camera, so the recognition system winds up trying to recognize what's on the body and just ignores the face. Um, obviously there's more complex systems, you know, being evolved every day to get around that. But for the moment, it's pretty, it works pretty good. And of course it's an evolving thing. It's just something that, that interests you and you integrate it into your, into this phase of, of our existence in society uh, as we move forward. So hopefully a place where we don't feel like we have to be use surveillance constantly on humans to uh, control them. Not, I mean, I'm not interested in that, but unfortunately governments are. Another 
activism uh, element I'd love to discuss is just the idea of like sharing data. When we think about sharing data, I, I think about like there's great ways to think about ideas, how we can share data with each other that are sort of lo-fi. And here's an example of what is like, a, what they call like a dead drop, which isn't a cool name, but they should <laughs> rethink it. But basically imagine, you know, public repositories of digital data that you can go to that, um, yes, while we have the internet, there's times where the internet is not around or just the idea of sharing data that's persistent, like what if internet is down and you need it to be able to, you know, help your community be resilient. Like let's say there's a flood and there's no internet. And if only you had like some data, you know, that you could rely on, you know, about different survival topics um, or even including like growing things, particular ideas, the idea of like a dead drop where, where it's like, um, where you put like, um, USB sticks, embed them into the infrastructure. And you could like, if you needed to return and get data there or share it with other people to be able to share it as you see here, <laughs> bring Predis, um, um, getting, you know, sharing data from a, a central repository in a public place is actually, you know, a very community related thing um, that is very cool. Um, the next thing I want to mention, let's go over QR codes. All right, so at the moment, so many of us have mobiles globally around the world. We, I love QR codes now because there's ubiquitous. And like I said, it, you could go to every continent and even people who may not have access to a computer have, have access to a cell phone. Now, is it too many cell phones? Yes, that's a conversation I would love to have. Do we are we on our phones too much? Yes, most of us are. Are there is it there's there a nascent movement to sort of use low-tech phones for communication? That yes, there is. I love that movement. Um, um, hopefully it becomes more widespread. But at the moment, I also love the idea of QR codes, like the idea that you could have a QR code not only for like communication of like, once again, of like data, it could be poetry, it could be, you know, I'm sure you've seen it like in museums or like around plants, like, you know, here's a way, a quick way for you to get knowledge. Like, is this plant edible? If it's not, one of the examples they gave here is like a, a hand-drawn one. So if you don't use a printer, you don't have to, you could make a QR code, like you could generate it on your computer and still have it sort of handcraft it. Like I don't have a printer myself. Um, I just not, for some reason I never liked printers and it just seems so wasteful, but you could do it by hand too. Um, I'm just giving examples of stuff, but it's a great way to like share data, share messages in public. And also too, it's interesting that it's sort of like a, when you make it like that, like an art thing. So like, so let's say you had a message about, let's say about environmental or community, related aspects, what's great about it is someone who might be turned off, it was like a poster that said, you know, said what it is. They're like, ah, I'm, I'm too insular for that. I don't want to do that. But then the QR code allows the, you know, artistic QR code allows them a way in. They might be like, wow, this is great. This is like a cool way to like, you know what I mean? To sort of like, um, to, uh, you know, to get into it. And they're like, okay, they have a private moment and be like, hey, maybe this is something I want to be involved in. Um, um, let's see. Uh, I want to talk about culture again. It, let's look at this. Is uh, was this was a great moment where K-pop fans use social media um, to disrupt hashtags. Um, in this particular case, it still goes on, but this was great. Like, I mean, this is also an example of activism. Like that is you know one hundred percent beagle. Like the idea that they were able to disrupt these conversations and just publish K-pop media disrupting these hashtags that were like racist, that racists were using to communicate and rally around. Um, they were able to disrupt um, um, police who were like trying to surveil and disrupt um, peaceful protests 
for the social matters. I think all of this um, becomes, these are all things to like think about, like not only in the sense that they look cool, but like I said, going forward in the future, if you were to participate in direct action or just even peaceful demonstrations. Like I took a walk um, myself, like in the, uh, I mean, I always have sort of a facial recognition defeat thing, but like I took a, a, a walk in the women's marches in, in New York City. And like, I definitely was able to spot police like trying to surveil um, and take photos of people in order to like identify who, you know, who they would feel need to be, needs to be in the database of, you know, what they would call troublemakers, even though you could argue, I mean, I would say like, who's a troublemaker? These people are marching, everyone's we're marching for, you know, reproductive rights, not for, you know what I mean? I, anyway, the point is, is that that's not how the state sees it. And sometimes it's not the state, it can be individual actors, but you don't, even in individual actors, it can still wind up into, <clears throat> into state actions, state level actions. Um, I'd also love to talk about, let's see, I only have a little bit of time left. And I have more <laughs> details to talk about than time, but um, let's see here. It, do you, I don't know if you guys remember this. This is um, this kid was following Elon Musk jet and several other celebrities in their usage of of private jets and the and and the running tally that that takes on the environment. Um, I think this is an example of what I would call like what we call like open source intelligence. Like he didn't he just used the public APIs of data streams of jets reporting. You know they have to file their flight times, and this was a great way to draw attention to the usage of of some some celebrities or famous people's um, um, use of private jets, which obviously, like a high usage of it, just increases the um, damage to the environment. But it's all, it was a great way of what it, of hacktivism of trying to you know a create a conversation. Um, awareness, um, uh, 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 even for some celebrities, they were like, they welcomed it. They didn't like necessarily being followed, but I mean, because there's an edge of privacy, but then there's also the edge where some of them were like, yeah, I wasn't really aware that my private jet usage actually totaled up to a lot of um, damage to the environment and they were grateful for it. Um, and, you know, and, and considered other ways of, of traveling um, to be able to, uh, so they would affect the environment less. Um, also, let me see, I'll finish off with um, <clears throat> the idea of like mesh networks. Now, in my, when we think about, this is an example of like, for instance, in Cuba, which is uh, an amazing place to go. I mean, the whole world's amazing to me, but I mean, Cuba is definitely an amazing place to visit and the resiliency of people there um, was really inspirational to me, um, but I could I could get into a long list of, of that. I think I'm amazed by human religiosity daily. But in this example, mesh networks like this, they made their own Wi-Fi network. Um, obviously, uh, uh, the government there um, doesn't necessarily want wide usage of the internet um, access around the world, but still, it's such a great way to share you know, information. So they sort of cobble together their own Wi-Fi network to be able to share data and information, media, music. It's, it's really amazing how it's, and of course it's actually illegal and you can get in trouble for it, but like the government kind of looks the other way on it um, just because it, it gives them like hope and joy and able to, like I said, to share things that before in Cuba, they would share like music, like on tapes, they would record, I remember they would re-record these like Tupac and Biggie tapes and share it and stuff like, and, and Bob Marley was big and they, they'd share it. And it, it still is, but what I mean is that like they made their own Wi-Fi network. Now, mesh networks are great. I think that like the idea of it, like in direct action, for instance, when you use your cell phone in a given area, the government and, and, and has ways to tap into it and you know map everyone's movements. But if you use mesh networks, like ad hoc 
networks in direct action or everyone turns off their phone, it really makes it more difficult for um, them to track people's movements and but still have access to data to be able to communicate with each with um, with other people during a direct action thing. But also the idea to me is also important because in the future, like if we made our own mesh networks, then like inside of a community, you could share data like in a given area. To me, it would be better, it would be better if we had our own like like community networks. And then in this current capitalist phase we live in, like corporations should pay us for access to our network to be able to privilege to to to, to share like um movies or whatever or ads or whatever they'd have to pay us for access to to our time um and and eyeballs but that's not the case because unfortunately at the moment most of that infrastructure is owned by them but like i said with the wireless networks we could create our own infrastructure in our community and it's also important to mention that it may come a time in the future where we might actually you know, need to highly consider doing our own, you know, our own resilient um, data networks, uh, which could be low powered. And of course, like um, not only low powered, but yeah, like like sustainable in, inside of our own communities.